So our next speaker is Guillaume Billon. He was born and raised in France, where he studied math, physics, and engineering science. Guillaume presently works as a computer scientist in finance on Wall Street. After a wholly improbable conversion from atheism to Christianity, he then went on to obtain a master's in biblical literature with emphasis on the New Testament and is now completing his PhD in philosophical theology under Paul Helm. Guillaume's areas of interest include the metaphysics of free will, its relationship with modal logic, natural theology, and epistemology. Guillaume is married to Catherine and he's the father of two, soon to be three, adorable babies. He is going to be speaking to us on Calvinists and Arminians on the problem of evil. Who can say what? Let's welcome Guillaume. Good morning. Given the hour, I'm going to try to be louder than your stomach's growling. Um, I, um, my name is Guillaume Bignon, and I'm told that French people should be critical of everything, so I'm going to begin with my own title. Uh, Calvinists and Armenians on the problem of evil. Who can say what? Um, first of all, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I'm not here to tell you what you can and cannot say, but maybe I should have better named it um, who should say what. That is the whole point of this talk, and maybe if you don't know what Calvinists and Armenians are, we'll get to that quickly. Um, but if you do know, then probably you're here anticipating some sort of a huge fight because that's what Christians like to fight about, the nature of free will. You have Calvinists in one camp and Armenians in another. And here again, I'm going to have to disappoint you. If you're looking for the big fight, it's not going to happen today. It's not really my purpose. Um, the purpose really is this friendly goal that I have, which is that uh, the problem of evil raises all sorts of questions uh, that Christians typically respond with brandishing free will. And I'm going to try to not so much convert you to the position which I hold on the issue of free will, so I can promise that I won't try too hard to convert you, though I have to warn you I might use Bibles. <laughs> but I will help you provide consistent answers. At least I'm going to lay out the issues to see what sorts of commitments you're making when you take positions on free will and see what sorts of responses that allows you to make when dealing with this tricky problem of evil. So I have a friendly goal, and I also want to make, point out right from the start that uh, the disagreement that opposes the Calvinists and the Armenians should, and again, emphasis on the should, should be a friendly disagreement. That is that free will is an important issue. I'm, I care greatly about this. I'm doing my doctoral work on the topic, so clearly I think that there is some great importance to getting it right. But it's far less important than the gospel. Right? And so I just want to preface everything I'm about to say about free will and the disagreements we have by saying that Calvinists and Armenians disagree on free will, but they agree on the most important thing, which is the gospel. When we are asked, what must I do to have eternal life? We provide the same answer. Repent and believe in Jesus and you will be saved. So I just want to make sure that this is clear from the start, that we care greatly about the gospel, and I care about free will, but this is really on a different scale of importance. Um, so why do we even care about free will this morning? We're talking about evil. Well, the problem is fairly simple. Um, if God, why evil is the title of this conference, um, our natural answer is to say, well, God doesn't do evil. 
Uh, we humans do, so I guess free will. That's the reason why there's evil. So lots of questions are then raised about the nature of this free will and what sorts of responses can we make to the atheist who uses evil against God depending on what we've already committed ourselves to believing about the nature of free will. So lots of those questions we're going to tackle today. I'm going to try for each of those to, to show you, not so much, again, to convince you that my position on free will is correct, but to show you on each side of the uh, debate, on each side of the disagreement, these are the things that you can say concerning those topics when discussing evil. So we're going to be accounting for evil. That is, we're going to try to explain what are all of the good reasons there might be for evil. Uh, we're going to be talking about deploring evil. Is there such a thing as a god being upset at evil? Is it really evil? Can each side, depending on their view of free will, really complain about evil? Uh, we're going to be talking about the issue of permitting evil. It's, it's uh, a very common phrase to say that God allows certain things to happen or permits certain things to happen. But depending on your view of free will, that might be tricky language here. Are we sliding and saying that there's a difference in what God does in the case of evil and what he does in the case of bringing the good. So we'll discuss a little bit of the issue of permitting evil. We're going to discuss purpose in evil. What, do, what difference does that make when we are committed to one view on free will? When we are saying whether, when we wondering whether or not there might be purpose in the evil that happens. And at the end, conquering evil. Um, so... I'll get quickly to the issue of definitions, and when I say Calvinists or Armenians, I just want to me make it clear that um, these are not instances of name-calling, so I mean no evil by those very labels. Um, in some circles, in some literatures, sometimes people complain, don't call me either of those because the labels are just prejudiced against me, and then people are going to think this is false just in, f in sheer virtue of the fact that you called me that. So the, the labels are simply a convenient way of identifying various positions. So it's perfectly fine for someone to not have a position. It's per perfectly fine for someone to say, I'm not really sure, I'm weighing the issues, I haven't committed myself. But on those questions, there are sides. And if you deny one, you must affirm the other. So we're going to simply quickly uh, see what are the various views that you can take on this issue and then we'll see what follows from those views. So again, Calvinists and Armenians, that's two camps, uh, they are conveniently named after two famous proponents of those positions. You have Calvin on the one hand, that's the French reformer, and he would take the position we're going to be calling Calvinism and I'll explain in a moment what that entails when in the area of free will. And then there's Arminius, the, uh, Jacob Arminius, um, who takes the opposite view on the nature of free will. So uh, if you haven't figured out exactly what position you take, and um, there are some, some, some conceptually difficult questions that need to be answered, I'm going to try to break it down easily, and we're going to take the quiz to figure out which one you are if you don't already know. So it's a little bit like a BuzzFeed quiz, where they sometimes ask you, 10 questions and you will give your answers and then they reveal to you what character from this movie you really are or what's your ideal job. Well, I'm going to have a much quicker quiz. I only have two questions and I'll tell you what your view is on the issue of free will and God's sovereignty. So the two questions that we need to um, answer is uh, first the free will question and then there's the foreknowledge question. So the first question that you have to answer is what is the nature of human free will? And here, there are only two responses for a Christian. You have in one camp what is called the libertarian, so that's a libertarian view of free will or libertarian free will. And these people say that free will is such that God does not determine the outcome of your choice. So you have a situation, you have various options open to you, and they say that you are indetermined, that is that at the moment where you make the choice, you could choose one way or another, all things being just as they are in this situation. So your uh, emotional makeup being just what it is, your, your education, your background, everything leading to the moment, the laws of nature, whatever influences you to reach that moment of choice, you still have a free will that is such that you can do one way or the other. 
So that's why it's, it's called indeterminist, and that's the libertarian view. So sometimes philosophers speak about a categorical ability to do otherwise. They say you have free will in the sense that you are categorically able to go one way or the other. And this um, categorical ability requires an indeterminist view of God's relationship to human beings. God is, maybe they might say that God is influencing your choice. They might say that he's fully in control, and we'll see a little bit later on what sort of control he can exercise, but he doesn't determine the outcome of your choice. So that's the uh, libertarian side. And the opposite side is the, it's called the compatibilist side, and I'll explain in a moment why that's called that, 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 but that's really just a denial of this first position, is to say, you make free choices, so that's the other side that does affirm this. So that's why I'm saying it's only for the Christians, because all Christians affirm that we make free choices, understood in the sense that our choices are morally meaningful. That is, that we can be morally responsible for what we choose. We are blameworthy and praiseworthy. So the compatibilist doesn't deny that. But he does say that those choices we make are fully determined by God's providence. That is, that God is fully in control of what happens, and he influences your heart and mind in such a way that whatever we choose is something that God is fully in control by determining the outcome. So we can easily see that there's really only two positions here, indeterminist or determinist, right? The denial of one is the affirmation of the other. And sometimes the, uh, so the reason it's called compatibilist is because um, the philosophers taking this position say that while you're determined, it's compatible with you being morally responsible. So that's the claim that is sometimes a bit counterintuitive, and that's definitely one of the arguments against this position. They say, if God determines what you do, he can't blame you or praise you for what you do. And no one, can, no one else can. So they say that free will um, is incompatible with determinism. So that's, that's one of the claims made by the libertarians against the compatibilist. And the compatibilists say, no, no, these, these two are compatible, and I affirm both. So... That's the free will question. You have to pick one camp or another if you want to take a position on this issue. Either you're indetermined, and that's the libertarian view of free will, or you're determined, and that's the compatibilist view of free will. Sometimes they speak of conditional ability to do otherwise because they will say there is one sense in which you can do otherwise. So you're determined to do the one thing you do, but they say for that choice to still, to still be morally meaningful, they say there's a certain kind of ability to do otherwise that you have, but it's not an ability to do otherwise while keeping all things exactly the same. They're saying it's simply an, uh, an ability to do otherwise conditionally if you had wanted to do otherwise. So it's a little bit of a subtlety, but it's allowing them to say, look, um, I don't have, uh, you know, let's say that we're taking a vote and I'm not raising my hand. It's a choice that I'm making because I disagree with the vote that is being taken. If I don't raise my hand, I, it can be said in the sense of the compatibilist that I still had the ability to do otherwise if we're just saying that my hands were not handcuffed behind my back, right? So that kind of inability to raise my hand, the compatibilist would say, well, see, that's clearly removing your choice in the matter, so you don't have a free will to raise your hand there. But if my hands are not handcuffed, then they would say, even though God determined that I would not raise my hand, we would say, well, I still had the ability if I wanted. Right? So it's a little bit of the subtleties and the nuances of the, the positions, but to clarify, you have determinists in one hand and indeterministic in the other. So that's the free will question that people take position on. And then you have the foreknowledge question. And here the foreknowledge question simply is this, is okay, you have taken a position on free will, now you need to take a position on what sorts of things God knows and foreknows about those free choices that we make. And so there are various options, so I put for libertarians only. Why is that a question only for libertarians? Because the, the uh, compatibilist or the determinist says that God determines everything that happens. If he does that, clearly he knows what's going on. So the libertarians are the ones who affirm an indeterminist view, that is, that God is not determining the outcome. So there are various different positions that have been taken by libertarians to say, well, these are the things God actually knows, and then there are some things that he doesn't know. So let me put a disclaimer. No one is saying that God is not omniscient. God is all-knowing. But they're simply saying that if, if free will is really indetermined, 
then it's impossible to know some of those things about what we do because there is no truth to the matter. So no one's denying omniscience. I don't want to be sounding like I'm making that claim. But you have to figure out, if you're a libertarian, what sorts of things God knows. So they are, these are the candidates for things that God could know about our choices. The past, that is what we have done, what we have chosen. No one denies that God knows that. So everyone affirms that. Then there's, there's the present, what we currently are doing. Clearly, no Christian in their right mind also denies this. God is existing, he sees what's going on, so he knows the present. But here is where people on the libertarian side start to deny some of those things. The future of what we will do, some say that if God foreknew what we will do, then that would mean that the choice must be determined. So they say, well, since we are not determined, then God does not know what we will do in the future. So that's one of the options that is taken by some. Then there's um, another type of truth about what we choose. It's called counterfactuals. It's statements about what we would do hypothet hypothetically in other situations. So consider any hypothetical set of circumstances. There's a truth to the, to the question, what would I do if that were the case? So you can, you know, take any hypothetical that you want. Uh, I'm speaking here on this podium, what would I do if my mom was to walk in the door? Clearly it's not going to happen, she's in France. <laughs> but there is a question raised, what would be the case? What would I freely choose to do if that were to happen, contrary to fact? So, again, a little bit of technicality, and I apologize if I'm... Uh, challenging you a little bit with the concepts, but these are the introductory matters to understand what sorts of commitments we're going to make when discussing the problem of evil. So these are the options for the libertarian, all after all from the past, the present. Some of them deny that God knows the future, and some yet others deny that God knows counterfactuals. So some folks will say, yeah, the future is no problem for God. That is, that it's compatible with libertarian free will for God to know what will happen. But some say that he cannot know what would happen in any hypothetical circumstances because that would be incompatible with indeterminism. So, again, you have to make your pick here if you've picked libertarian free will on the previous question. So, you pick one view of free will, determinist or indeterminist, that is libertarian or compatibilist, and then you pick one set of beliefs that God knows if you've picked libertarian free will, and that will give you your position. So, brace yourselves, these are the results. These are the results the resulting positions based upon your choices on those two questions. The first is liberty and free will, and God knows the past and the present only, then you are an open theist. That's the name that's been given to these folks who say that God doesn't know what will happen in the future. Clearly, God doesn't either know what would happen hypothetically. If he doesn't know what will happen, how much less can he know what would happen? Um, so, the open theists are affirming those things, libertarian free will and the past and the present. Then there's the camp that affirm libertarian free will and then past, present and future. That's the classical Armenian. Or sometimes they are called simple foreknowledge Armenians. And these people simply affirm this, libertarian free will, God knows the past, the present and the future, but he doesn't know the counterfactuals. And then you have the camp called Molinists, that's the libertarian free will, plus past, present, future, and counterfactual. So the Molinist affirms the whole set of knowledge with liberty and free will. They're called Molinist because that's the position that was uh, introduced by uh, Molina. Luis de Molina was a, a Jesuit counter-reformer, um, and he's the one who very much elaborated on this view. And then you have the compatibilist, compatibilist view of free will, which affirms obviously all the, facts of the, all the kinds of knowledge that we have, and those are the Calvinists. So, lots of labels, lots of new concepts, maybe some new for some, maybe some that are very familiar with this. Um, but these are the basis to discuss a little bit the commitments. You can be, in this, in this debate on the nature of free will and for knowledge, you can be an open theist, a classical Armenian, a Molinist, or a Calvinist. And by the very definitions I introduced, it's clear that there are no alternatives. That is, these are the only combinations of all the questions that you can raise on these matters. So, if you have this chart in front of you, it's really convenient to figure out where we're talking here. Um, small disclaimer. Uh, well, first of all, the uh, first three positions 
are properly called Armenian. So uh, my title was uh, Armenians and Calvinists, you know, what, who can say what. The real divide is uh, on the, the three on the top and the one on the bottom. That is, the real divide is on the nature of free will. They're all libertarians here. They only disagree on what kind of foreknowledge we have, uh, God has. And then there's the Calvinists who affirm that we are determined. So these are the issues. These are the contenders in our debate. Um, I shall not resolve necessarily those issues, but we're going to unpack, okay, now, given that we affirm this, we affirm one of those, then who can say what? Disclaimer, I'm all the way to the bottom. Right? So I'm a Calvinist, and I believe that uh, free will is compatible with determinism, that is, that God decrees what we do, and we are still morally responsible. I won't be preaching this truth to you, I won't even be defending it much, but I'm just letting you know my, my true colors so that you can keep me accountable to being somewhat balanced in the statements I'm going to make afterwards. Um, so we're going to, given that, we're going to see a little bit what, uh, what can be said. So the question is raised. Now, once you affirm one of those positions, what sort of control does God have on each of those views? That is, how is God involved in directing the outcome of what we choose? Keep in mind, we're here to discuss the problem of evil. So the relevant question is, how much does God have to do with any of the things that happen in this world? So I sorted those views again in a way that you can see um, open theism on top here. Okay, remember, God doesn't know what's going to happen in the future, and he doesn't determine our choices. So... God is trying to influence what we're going to do, but he cannot guarantee any of what we do because he just doesn't even know. So the kind of providence that the open theist affirms is very mild. God is not very much in control of what's going on. He's clearly, he's extremely smart. Um, he knows everything about the present and the past, so he's well informed to guess and to try to orient the best he can, but he doesn't know, so clearly he's not strongly in control compared to the other views. Then you have the classical Arminian um, that says, well, the God does know what's going to happen in the future. Now, what kind of control does that give to God if he knows what will be the case, that he knows what we will freely do? What I'm arguing is that this actually doesn't give a whole lot more control to God than if it was open theism, because you want to raise the question, if God foreknows that I will freely choose to eat pizza tomorrow, it's an additional piece of information that he has uh, compared to the God of open theism, who is still clueless as to what I will choose to eat tomorrow. But knowing what I will choose doesn't equip God to influence or change that uh, decision one bit, because if he already knows I will do that, then logically it's impossible that he change this. Right? So if he knows that this will be the case, then it's already logically too late in, a, some, in one way for him to change anything of that. If he were able to change my decision, then it would be false that I will eat a pizza tomorrow. So the classical Armenian view that affirms the future but still denies counterfactuals doesn't really afford a whole lot more of control to God over human affairs. So then a little bit higher you have the Molinist view and the Molinist affirms all of those things. So you have a God now who still doesn't determine the outcome of human free will, but he controls it through the knowledge of what, of counterfactuals, so it's the knowledge of what would happen if we were to be placed in one situation or another. So this is great because it allows him to, to know, okay, if I were to put them in this scenario, they would choose this. If I were to put them in another scenario, maybe they should choose differently. So he has much more control than on open theism and on classical Arminianism in order to bring about some of his purposes. So that's a much higher view of providence. And then you have the Calvinist view where God controls absolutely everything because he determines absolutely everything. So I put them on the scale, if you will, of providence. And I put the, uh, the sharp... Uh, problems that appear on one end of the spectrum or the other. That is that if you're a Calvinist, then providence is not going to be a problem at all because your God is decreeing absolutely everything, so his purposes come about in all cases. Is We clearly have no problem affirming that God is in control and is, providential, is in providential control of human affairs. But the more you affirm 
free will and the uh, lesser view of providence, the easier time you have in explaining evil. Because, you know, if God is not really in control, then there's plenty of evil that happens, but uh, you can't really blame God for it because he's just not bringing it about. He's, he's trying to guide it the best he can, but not really controlling the evil. So, you have this sliding scale where you can see that uh, the more to the bottom you'll be, the easiest it will be to account for providence and the more difficult it's going to be to account for evil. All right? So, now that all the preliminaries about free will are in place, let's discuss the problem of evil. So, the alleged conflict that is um, offered by the atheist is between th three truth claims that the Christian makes. God is omnipotent, God is all good, and evil exists. So, the immediate response is that there is no contradiction in those things. Uh, in order to make this a contradiction, the atheist is presupposing additional truth, and he's presupposing various premises that we need to extract in order to see which ones may or may not be true. And so, the premises that must be added to those in order to reach a contradiction are these. The two deniable assumptions are that if God is omnipotent, he would bring about absolutely all he wants, he could bring about absolutely all he wants. And if God is all good, he wouldn't want to bring about any evil. Then and only then, if those two things are true, then we have a contradiction. The problem is that Christians have denied both of those things. Um, so the first one is not true if we have liberty and free will. That is that if we have liberty and free will, it's not true that if God is omnipotent, he could just bring about absolutely all he wants. And the second one is not true, if, that if he's all good, he wouldn't want to bring about any evil. Well, not if he has good reasons. You know, those kinds of responses have already men been mentioned by some of the previous speakers. If God uh, gives us liberty and free will, then he can't just bring about absolutely everything he wants. And if he has good reasons for evil, then it's not the case that he wouldn't bring about evil. If he's good, got good reasons, then let's do it. So those two assumptions are going to be part of the responses that Christians are going to give to the problem of evil. So let's look at the problem like this. To account for evil, you have all this big bubble of unexplained evil. And what the Christian task at hand is, is that we're going to try to cover up this explanation, this unexplained evil, by the various explanations that can be possibly done, so possibly given by the Christians. Here are some of the possible explanations, some of the ones that we know are true, that explain away, well, not really explain away, but that provide a satisfactory explanation of evil. So we're going to try to cover this. Uh, the way in which we do this, Joe, just a, a comment, because atheists can get confused about this. We're going to provide various different sorts of answers that are going to account for little bits of evil here and there. So the, the, the goal is to cover the entire bubble but it doesn't have to be one answer fits all. And for example, uh, atheist Walter Sinut Armstrong, in a debate on the question of whether the problem of evil disproves God, once listed all the common responses that Christians give to the problem of evil. And he listed evil is a punishment for sin, evil is repaid in heaven, evil is necessary for free will, evil builds good character, evil leads people to glorify God, God has a reason and we don't know it. All of those reasons that are usually given by Christians. And he says, but for each of those, I can find counterexamples. Sure, not, no individual one response will cover all cases of evil. But that doesn't mean that they are not good reasons. So if you just collect them and just patch the entire bubble, you might very well cover it, cover it all. And there is no reason to think that one single point should cover everything. The same mistaken assumption was given by Bart Ehrman, who in the uh, book God's Problem, where he's pressing the problem of evil, he writes this. Well, this is the, the cover of the book that details what the content is. I don't usually read Bart Ehrman on philosophy because I like the people I read to actually know what they're talking about. But so I, I, di I did read the uh, cover because that sounded interesting, how this textual critic is talking about the philosophical problem of evil. And he says, that says this. In times of questioning and despair, people often quote the Bible to provide answers. Surprisingly, though, the Bible does not have one answer, but many answers, with scare quotes, that often contradict one another. Consider these competing explanations for suffering put forth by various biblical writers. The prophets, suffering is a punishment for sin. The book of Job, 
which offers two different answers. Suffering is a test and you will be rewarded later for passing it. And suffering is beyond comprehension since we are just human beings and God, after all, is God. Ecclesiastes, suffering is the nature of things, so just accept it. All apocalyptic texts in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, God will eventually make right all that is wrong with the world. And so he takes all of those and says, well, look, there's contradictions, which clearly shows he doesn't know what a contradiction is. They're not contradicting one another. They're just saying there's this bit of evil that can be explained in that way, and there's another bit of evil that can be explained in that way. So the task at hand is simply to cover the bubble with various explanations. So what does that look like? Well, um, on the two assumptions that we've just denied, right, the two deniable assumptions of the atheists, there is libertarian free will. Libertarian free will could very well account for a whole lot of evil, and if we have libertarian free will, that explains why some of this evil happens under God's watch, and there is no problem there. And then the other assumption that we denied was, well, God might have good reasons. So if libertarian free will and God having good reasons can cover the entire bubble, then there is no problem of evil. So these are the two assumptions we just denied, but of course, uh, libertarian free will we've just established is not available to the Calvinists. The Calvinist is the one that our free will is not libertarian in fact, so God does control everything, so he's granting the premise of the atheist and says, yes, God is very well able to bring about whatever he wants. So the Calvinist has to not use that uh, pink bubble of libertarian free will I put in there, and he has to cover the entire bubble with um, good reasons. That is that God, for evil, must have good reasons. Um, we'll discuss a little bit later what the nature of those reasons are, but um, let's probe a little bit on how we employ those two responses. So the Armenian view sometimes when you listen to Armenians and read the literature, they might sound like they're offering this view, that is, the libertarian free will is here, and then there is God having good reasons there. That is that most of the evil is explained by libertarian free will, and there's a little bit for which there's God has morally sufficient reasons. And there, it's not entirely without justification, right? I mean, if you think of all the evil that happens in the world, a lot of time it involves human making really messed up choices. You know, someone lied to you, someone stole from you, someone assaulted you, someone, someone, someone. Well, they're making free choices. If they have libertarian free will, why not? But I want to suggest that maybe the uh, Armenian view probably should more look, should look more something like this. You have libertarian free will, clearly use it. It's one of the strengths of your positions if you are an Armenian. But you probably should account for evil in that way for the following reasons. Uh, one... There's natural evil that David already mentioned. There's an incredible amount of evil that happens in this world, not through human free choices, but simply through means that are purely natural, that is, uh, cat catastrophes, you know, earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, diseases. All of these things happen purely on naturalistic terms, and God, regardless of what kind of free will he's given us, is fully able to prevent them. So for those, we won't want to brandish free will and explain this. We want to say God has good reasons for allowing those things to happen. Then there is uh, the animal actions. You know, I'm reading some libertarians, some uh, who cr criticize Calvinism. And actually, William Hasker is an open theist, and he cr criticizes both Calvinism and Molinism by saying um, that it's inappropriate for God to allow on those views such thing as a spider trapping and killing a moth or a pack of wolves starving off the cubs of an opposing pack. Now, uh, again, that's emotionally appealing, but let's think for a moment. What does that commit him to say? That commits him to say that animals have libertarian free will. I don't think that's plausible even if you are Armenian and you think libertarian free will is possessed by humans. I mean, animals don't have self-conscious awareness. They don't have free will. So you don't want to push the bar. And, and clearly, animal actions must be accounted for without libertarian free will. Uh, then there is the uh, tragic human incidents. Um, you know, there's some criticism sometimes. I mean, some things happen in life that are not directly the result of human free choices. Um, and that are really hurting and highly problematic to account for. They are really evil. And so you, you find, for example, the, um, 
Armenians, Jerry Walls and Joseph Dondrell, in criticizing Calvinism, they're saying that uh, you want to consider the instance of a teenager who is paralyzed in an automobile accident because the brakes in his car failed. And um, they're saying that Calvinism can be right if that's the case. Well, the problem is no free choice was involved in the breaking of the brakes, right? It's purely a naturalistic incident. The car doesn't have free will. So God is not sitting in heaven looking at the car incident. I wish I could determine the outcome differently, but the car has free will, so I can't determine things otherwise. No, clearly the accident is fully under the watch of God and must be accounted for. So, the again, liberty and free will will not be accessible for this. Then you have the horrendous sicknesses um, when these are some of the most emotional stories you could possibly bring in discussing evil, but you know when a child gets a horrendous diseases and screams, and you, you s read lots of those stories in lots of the literature criticizing Calvinism as well, or they say, well, how can God allow such things? The problem is this has nothing to do with free will. You know, if there's a child that has cancer, do you think that God can heal him even if he has libertarian free will? Of course. God is fully omnipotent, he can heal whoever he wants. So sicknesses don't really work to be explained by liberty and free will. Um, so for all these reasons, then we should be saying that uh, for, we should be saying that God has good reasons, even if we are convinced that liberty and free will is true. Um, I put also the outcome of free choices, that's a little bit of a tricky one, but sometimes even if there's some free choice involved at the beginning of uh, evil, then many times over we can say, okay, well, maybe God couldn't determine things to be differently here, but he could very well have prevented or minimized the outcome, right? You think of, for example, uh, Greg Boyd criticizes Calvinism by saying, you know, consider the story of a, a young teenage girl who gets uh, kidnapped and then locked in a dungeon for years and uh, repeatedly abused and so on, and says, well, think of a God who determines that. Okay, so... Now there's a free choice, so clearly the criminal could be said to have libertarian free will, but then if we have your libertarian free will, don't you think that God could do something to prevent the ensuing evil afterwards? He could strike the rapist dead, you know, he could give him a heart attack and let's get it done with. So he could rescue the victim, but he doesn't, and so what would the Armenian say? The Armenian would say, well, God doesn't do it, he has a morally good reason and all Calvinists agree. So, for all these reasons, I would say, you know, let's, let's say instead that God has good reasons. Uh, and here I include liberty and free will in there, because in the end, really, liberty and free will is one kind of reason, right? God could have a good reason to allow evil, liberty and free will being one of those. So, we'll move forward. So, there are two kinds of good reasons we give. Uh, there are those we know, that is, that sometimes in our lives we know that something happened for a purpose. Dan's talk was all about this, in instances where we know that something had a very good reason and we praise God because that came about. So that would be called a theodicy. And a, a part of that for Armenians could be libertarian free will, right? If they say that libertarian free will, having free will is a good thing, then the fact that God gives it to us accounts for a good amount of evil. And then there's those we don't know, and here the, the, the expression is skeptical theism, it's just a claim to say, well, we, there are all of these uh, instances of evil that I don't have an explanation for, but uh, I just trust that there is a reason even if I don't know it. And why is that reasonable? Because I just know that, as uh, David pointed out, I am very limited in my cognitive faculties to guess what those good reasons could be, I just trust that they exist. So. Uh, here again, you have those we don't know and those, those we know and those we don't know. I split it in half, but really the real picture it looks more like this. Those we know account for a tiny fraction of the evil that happens to us, and for the rest, we should be saying we don't know. Um, so the question of deploring evil, here is one point on which uh, Calvinists and Armenians are going to be saying different things. Um, the Armenian will say that God deplores evil in one sense and is okay with it in another sense, in the same way that Calvinists say the same thing. It is that um, the Armenian says that maybe we have free will so that God did not determine the outcome, but he still preferred us to make the choice in a libertarian way. So then, all things considered, God is okay with the evil happening because for the greater good of having liberty and free will. So in one sense, God has the will that the evil doesn't happen, 
But in another sense, he does have the will that the evil happen because he prefers the libertarian free choice to be made over just removing free will altogether. So that's one question on which Calvinists and Arminians can agree, it's simply saying that God deplores evil in one sense, but he has another greater sense in which he's okay with it happening. And then the point on which there is a genuine disagreement is that Arminians can affirm a quantitatively higher disdain for sin because they can say that God really wishes some of these sins hadn't occurred if only he could have made us freely do otherwise. All right. So that's going to be one point of difference, but the Calvinist is committed to saying that, um, that God brought it about and that was the best design that he had in the situation, all things considered. So then there's the question of permitting evil. Sometimes we're said that uh, if our free will is determined, then we can't say that God just permits evil. We must say that he causes it or intends it or something much stronger than permitting. Here, I'm going to skip all the details to reach the conclusion because it's a very tricky question, but I'm just going to give you one story that I think plausibly explains how we want to think about God permitting anything to happen. And here, the issue is how we can account for an asymmetry. That is, that how is this that God does something different in the case of bringing something good and in the case of bringing something evil? That is, that when God permits evil, we're saying that there is a more of a passive attitude from God towards the fact that the evil is happening that is different from the way that he actively brings about the good. When he, he gives all our virtues and the goodness and the blessings in life, it's more active. And when he permits evil, there's a sense of passiveness. And here, I'm just putting two images to explain, illustrate the matter. And we can discuss this in, later on in Q&A. Um, what I suggest for the language of permission to be employed correctly is this. Consider a burglar who's climbing up a ladder to uh, break into a house. And then there's a passerby that comes that sees this thing going on and has, he's at the foot of the ladder and he has a choice to make. And now he can either just let the burglary happen or he can actively kick the ladder and uh, let the burglar fall on his face and prevent the burglary. Because what the passerby knows is that if he were to let the climber go up, then the burglary would happen. But if he were to kick the ladder, then he would prevent the crime. So what you have is counterfactual knowledge. You know, the, these are the statements I mentioned earlier again. He knows what would happen if he were to do one thing or would happen if he were to do another thing. So I'm saying that this language of uh, asymmetry between active and passiveness for God is justified if God knows counterfactuals. Same thing, imagine a bobsled. The bobsled is sliding down the track and consider the activity of accelerating or braking. That is, the pilot is using the brakes to slow down, and what does he do to accelerate? He just passively lets it slide. So the driver is fully in control of what's going on. He decides when it's sliding and when it's uh, braking, but there's a difference in the activity he does when he's just permitting it to slide and when he's actively preventing it by pressing the brakes. And I suggest that God's relationship to good and evil is a bit like that, Assuming that God knows what would happen if he were to actively extend more grace in our hearts and what would be the case if he were to just passively let us express our sinfulness. So this is a symmetry that's rescued by this, but as I've expressed it and made it very clear, that requires that you affirm counterfactuals. So I think to properly account for divine permission of evil, you must be either a Molinist or a Calvinist. That is, that they are, they are the only two camps that kind of uh, affirm counterfactuals. Then there's the question of purpose in evil. Um, I'm going to be brief on this because time is pressing, but the um, libertarian views are going to be saying that at you know, all of those libertarian views, no matter which view of providence they affirm, they're going to be saying that there are some instances where there's a sin that occurs and that there is no other purpose than God just letting liberty and free will express itself. That is that no matter how strong your view of providence is on libertarianism, even if you're a Molinist, which is the highest view of providence for a libertarian, you're still committed to saying that libertarian free will prevents God from, actually, from actualizing a state of affairs that he really would have act actualized differently if he had been able to. So with those views, then the Armenians are committed to saying that um, 
there, are, there is some evil that is truly purposeless. So it's not entirely purposeless because it's no other purpose than liberty and free will, but that's one of the benefits of the Calvinist view here, that the Calvinist says in every single instance of evil that happens to us, we can rest assured that there is a specific purpose intended by God. So again, I'm not preaching one view or the other to you this morning, simply highlighting the difference in how you deal with pain and suffering. Calvinists affirm purpose in all of it. Arminians must affirm that some of it is due only to liberty and free will. Conversations on the problem of evil, no matter how intricate they can get, and we've seen that they can get rather technical as soon as we start to speak about free will, there are lots of complex issues. I'm saying that they should, by the Christian, you should intend to wrap up with the ultimate issue of conquering evil. And the fact that on your worldview, God has promised ultimately to wipe away every tears. And obviously there are questions about providence, you know, if God is... Not, he doesn't even know what will happen in the future, or can he even pull it off? But whether if you're a Molinist or a Calvinist, you're from different views of free will, ultimately, we want to bring things to a completion on the crucifixion of Jesus. That is, that it's, it's discussing the problem of evil with the atheist, because you're taking one instance of evil, and then you're explaining how there are good purposes behind it, in the way it's been expressed earlier by speakers. But there is a definite power in mentioning the cross. I mean, Paul definitely preached this in the epistles. He said that I chose to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. So in discussing the problem of evil with the atheist and highlighting the good purposes of God in evil, it, I find it very helpful to conclude on the cross no matter what. And here again, it's a great example of God having a control over something that happened through human free will, right? Jesus was not killed by an accident. He was killed by a judicial murder. So people were involved in that, the plot, the false witnesses, all of the condemnation was brought about by human free will. And yet, the Bible says in Acts 2 and Acts 4 that this was according to the very definite for, um, the foreknowledge and plan of God that had uh, predetermined those things to happen. So again, regardless of your view of free will, how you interpret this predetermination, it still remains that God is fully in control of something really evil that brings about an internal good. And that allows me to conclude and finish where I began, that this response is available to both Calvinists and Armenians, and I'm saying this should end at the foot of the cross. Regardless of your view of free will, we conclude with this, that God in Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, so that if we repent and believe in him, we shall have eternal life. This answers the problem of evil for the Christian, and this is the place where Calvinists and Armenians are in agreement and should wrap up their conversations on evil. So enjoy the disagreements, enjoy the debates with your fellow Christians who don't have the same view of free will, but ultimately we're not about Calvin, we're not about Arminius, we're about Jesus, and the gospel is that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, something we all affirm.